Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much. And as you can see, uh, my scientific hero is uh, Frank Jacob. Um, and if you're confused, uh, this is Jacob. And then the one who is smoking in the back is uh, uh, Jack Mono, <laughs> the Pasteur Institute. Um, I'm interested in how one cell becomes two cells. And about four years ago, when we, as a new assistant professor, when I was writing a, a bunch of proposals, and I, you know, in retrospect, I did something very crazy, which was a, uh, asking very general questions, which is, um, how does how do cells actually know their size? And as you can see, the question is very simple. The problem with the simple question is either they are too trivial to answer or they are almost impossible to answer. So I made a mistake uh, in that respect. So, but after three years, uh, I'm very happy to tell you what I found out so far. So uh, the, the specific subtitle of this talk is that the how to decompose your cell size control into individual modules. And that is the uh, most recent lessons that we've learned. So here's the uh, uh, classic uh, the quantitative law known as the growth law. Basically, it tells you as the cells grow faster in a neutron growth medium, how much bigger these cells uh, become. Okay? And there's some simple exponential relationship between the average size and then their growth rate. The faster the cells grow because you grow them in, in a nutrient-rich medium, and they become exponentially larger uh, uh, as they become uh, faster. And the good thing about this is that it's quantitative, and you can use this as a kind of a predictor for cell size. So if you, for example, know how fast your cell is growing, you can predict exactly how big uh, they are. It works. The problem with this law is that yeah, nobody understood where this actually came from. Okay? And this is a fairly general, uh, almost universal law uh, for single cell organisms in bacteria, at least enteric bacteria, but uh, the origin was very uh, not known. Okay? A few years ago, when you were doing a lot of experiments, growth experiments at the single cell level, using the mother machine that we developed in our lab, we noticed that yeah, individual cells actually do something as if to sense how big they are and correct uh, how big they are. Okay? Eventually, this, this became known as the Adder Principle. Okay? What this says is that, the, uh, first, let's focus on the, uh, this time-lapse experiment. The cell is born at some size, and it grows, and at some point, it divides in the middle, uh, and one cell becomes two cells. What this Adder Principle tells us is that the, uh, no matter what the newborn size is, this cell only cares about the how much larger, in a relative sense, they grow. So, so they grow, they add nearly constant size delta, and then divide in the middle. It doesn't care about the how big it was at the birth, at, and the how big it is uh, at division. Okay? And then this is, if you take this seriously, then the size homeostasis uh, can be explained in a very quantitative and predictive way. We show that uh, this works for E. coli and also for B. subtilis, uh, both bacteria, but they are billion years divergent. And then after we published this paper, and, another, and also there's another paper that came out simultaneously with our paper, the field essentially exploded. So the number of, uh, the list of uh, uh, adders really has been really increasing exponentially from bacteria to uh, even mammalian cells, uh, which I learned uh, a few weeks ago in a, a cell size conference in Germany. So we're very happy with this, okay? But the real question is, what determines the cell size? Okay? So that is the real question. And the other principle is like an essentially single cell level correlation. It simply tells you for given size and the given growth conditions how, individual, how much individual cells uh, will add uh, uh, in terms of size until division. The biggest lesson uh, we learned from the other principle is as follows. It's something evolutionary. That E. coli and B. subtilis a billion years divergent. The distance is, is further than between uh, you and the elephant. Okay? And there are textbook examples of how gram-negative and gram-positive organisms differ in their cell cycle, cell cycle control at the molecular level. So the lesson for us was that yeah, we got to stay away from the molecules. Okay? Forget about the molecules and rather just think about what every daughter cell inherits regardless of the, uh, uh, their species. And the good news was that there are uh, the only three things. There are the chromosomes, the proteins, and cell envelope. Okay? 
So uh, we decide to drop everything, and there was uh, uh, George. We decide to focus on one thing. So we drop everything and focus on these three things and how they talk to each other. Okay? The problem with this approach was that yeah, so what, we, what, we, what we really set out to do was to perturb a synthesis of each of these, what we call the trinity, and how the perturbation uh, is communicated with the synthesis of the other two of the trinity. The problem with this was that the, although it was a very simple strategy, the parameter space we had to search was so large that we just couldn't possibly do the single cell level experiment. And we simply estimated how long it would take, and it was going to be something like a 20 years with the five postdocs. So there was no way I could finish this. So what I decided to do was that the, uh, we went back to the uh, population level experiments temporarily, okay? as you can see. So, uh, once we defined the parameter space we wanted to search, all these uh, physiological perturbations, two people in my lab teamed up, and then they come up with uh, what Jim Collins showed in the morning, this kind of evol uh, ev uh, evolver machines. That basically, this is a multiplex mini turbido stuff. So each of these uh, vial is cartoon, uh, it, it can be represented in this kind of cartoon. Basically, you have a small mini turbido stuff vial. And then a coli culture is growing in a constant environment. Air goes in, air comes out. Media goes in, and media comes out. And everything, everything is controlled uh, by computer. And then uh, uh, this is controlled by feedback system, uh, all independent, uh, independently. Okay. So here's one a set of uh, uh, examples, and what the growth curves uh, would look like in this kind of multiflex machines. Okay. So. We are all growing the uh, isogenic population in eight uh, different conditions. The basal growth media are the same, but what is different is that yeah, in each vial has a different concentrations of a uh, clone phenicol because we wanted to, for example, uh, inhibit translations of protein synthesis, and we wanted to see how the cell size and the growth rate and everything else changes, for instance. Okay? And here's one example. So as the clonpenical concentration increases, the growth slows down, as you can see. Okay? And this is how cell size changed. <coughs> so basically, initially, the growth slows down, and the cell size becomes slower. And then, OK, we thought that it's OK, because it's just like the growth law, the cells grow slower, the cells become smaller too. Okay? But then, if you push them too hard, at some point, they decide to grow larger again. Okay? We were totally confused. We thought that we did something wrong. And then we did a lot of experiments. Okay. And the problem was that the, uh, everything changed so badly. So for example, you start from very fast growth conditions. You add clone panicol in the increasing order. Cell size uh, growth rate always decreases. Cell size decreases, but at some point it comes back. If you start from the uh, very slow growth conditions in the first place, the growth rate slow, uh, uh, decreases, but cell size increases. Okay? So there's no obvious pattern. We looked at other parameters. We looked at the cell cycle parameters. And the normal nutrient conditions, the replication period plus division period is constant. You have the clone panicle. Everything slows down there. If you measure the ribosome content, because we're also interested in the, uh, uh, the protein composition, and a lot of things changed. Okay. So we worked really hard to model this data, and then we couldn't really get out of the, uh, 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 this rabbit hole. And then we did the more experiments. So we are really going to become destined to become one of those uh, 4,980 companies who fail every year, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Until the new postdoc, who were trained in a, a slightly different field, came to my lab and looked at everything and asked very naive but a simple question which completely changed uh, everything we were doing. To, before talking about it, let me just uh, briefly remind you what the bacterial cell cycle, E. coli cell cycle is like. When the cells grow very slowly, there's enough time between birth and division so that uh, E. coli can finish one round of replication like this. So it's a cir single circular genome. Replication bubble is created. It grows bidirectionally. But as you give them better food, and the cells grow faster and faster, you cannot accelerate uh, replication speed. Maybe there's a physical limit. 
but the cells somehow grow and divide much more frequently. So what E. coli does is that it does parallel processing. So before the previous round of replication finishes, the new round of replication is a, uh, uh, starts. Okay? So that's why you have a bubble within bubble, and you can create you know, four or five uh, bubbles and so on. So the simple question Fang Wei asked was that, yeah, well, in these complex situations or simple situations, how much cell volume or cellular resources are dedicated to start one round of replication? It's a classic question about so-called initiation mass for DNA replications. Okay? So he was asking that question. The reason we hadn't asked those questions was that the, uh, as we ch add antibiotics, you are essentially inhibiting biosynthesis of everything, starting from ribosomes or regular proteins or DNAs and so on. So if that question didn't even occur to us, that it wouldn't be meaningful. And then when we did that, when we looked at the data, something very remarkable happened, like this. That under growth inhibition, cell size and growth rate changed in a way that we just couldn't uh, possibly make sense out of. But if you calculate how much cellular resources are devoted to one round of replication, and this cell size collapses onto this single master line, no matter what you do, everything collapses onto this one. Now, look at this one. This particular horizontal line, if you extend it, means at the y-intercept of this classic growth law. So what came out really was yeah, what the Donaki in the 1960s for wrong region called the unicell, which is the fundamental cellular unit. Okay? It's a building block of a cell size and cellular resources to maintain your physiology growth in the cell cycle. So as a reminder, this unicell is equivalent to the initiation mass per replication origin, regardless of the replication conditions. And it is the uh, lambda equals zero limit. So as the cell growth critically slows down, the cells become smaller and smaller, and finally reaches this some fundamental building block size. It's a minimal cellular resources to, for the cells to be able to start uh, growth and the cell cycle. Okay? So we went back to the uh, basics, and then ah, before doing that, we got so worried, again, that uh, maybe this was a very remarkable result. This invariance was uh, something we couldn't imagine, but maybe this was very specific for clone clinical only. So we did a bunch of experiments and perturbed all this, and I can assure you this unicell was invariant under all these perturbations from translation to uh, cell size and cell division. Excuse me. Okay. So if you step back, and then if, actually, if you think about the whole processes, in fact, we realize mathematically there is a very simple relationship, be relationship between cell size and then all other physiological uh, uh, control parameters. So basic, the message here is that the cell size is the sum of all unicells, and then the number of unicells is given by this exponential function where tau cycle is the uh, duration of a cell cycle and tau is the doubling time of the cells. So this is power of two means that whenever there's a new round of replications, the number of ores is doubles. Okay? And S0 itself is the size of unicells. Okay? So cell size is a sum of all these unicells. And what is different from the classic, uh, the growth law, is that the, uh, there's not only one parameter, there are only three control parameters that control the cell size. In other words, for given cell size, there are infinite number of possibilities of a physiological states which can give you essentially the same cell size, the multifold replications to non-multifold replications or non-growing cells even. Okay? So what it found out was essentially there's kind of modular structure of cell size control determined by the three control parameters, and we decide to go after changing each parameter one at a time. So what you're doing, essentially, uh, with the, all these uh, antibiotics, was something like this. If there are three parameters underlying cell size control, and then by changing the nutrient condition, what you are doing is changing the growth rate only. But if you change, if you add antibiotics, not only the growth rate, but also the cell cycle duration uh, changes. So what we wanted to do to really push this hard, we wanted to control this and that uh, individually. 
so we already heard about the CRISPR uh, interference system. So Shin Tian Li, I say a scientist in my lab, who single-handedly developed the, uh, the uh, CRISPR interference system, essentially optimizing what the Jonathan Weissman and Carol Gross uh, uh, did. Uh, a couple of years ago. This, our system is very clean, so the, it's a very, very, uh, almost a zero uh, leak expression. You start from the wild type level of expression, and then you can essentially titrate the level of expression uh, in a linear fashion. So here's one example. Um, we decide to, for example, ch elong, uh, change the cell cycle duration by slowing down replications or uh, inhibiting cell division. As you can see, without changing the growth rate, then cell cycle we can increase and then the cell size changes accordingly following this general growth law okay? and there's no uh, uh, adjusted parameters here and then in the meantime the fundamental unicell size also is invariant. We can also go after and controlling the unicell size itself and then and so on and so forth. So here's a summary statement of uh, uh, our um, decoupling experiment. So for all these three trinity, we can ch control each parameter one at a time, and then um, their cell size changes based on um, our general growth law, which is summarized here. So the bottom line is as follows. Cell size is sum of all unicells, and the number of unicells is determined by both the cell cycle and growth in a quantitative way. This works not only for the classic experiments in the 1950s, this works for any steady state conditions with or without drugs, whatever perturbations you prefer. So here's the summary. In the 1950s, people discovered the growth law, which became the foundational principle of uh, bacterial physiology. More than 50 years later, we discovered the adder and then finally understood where the y-axis came from, which is essentially the average of how much cells add between birth and division. Okay? And uh, finally, we actually understand where everything comes from. Okay? All these perturbations and looks like random scatter plots uh, of E. coli cells growing under perturbations, this general growth law explains where this original uh, exponential function came from by uh, this very general uh, balanced growth relationship. So this is a story uh, I wanted to tell you. And then one last thing I wanted to tell you was that, the, uh, as I said, we ask very simple but risky questions. It's very fundamental questions. Now I'm a mid-career scientist writing grants, and I realize these kind of questions are not really favorably reviewed by uh, most reviewers. Okay. So I really wanted to thank you uh, at the Paul Allen Foundation and also uh, NSF who really appreciated uh, uh, in supporting the very basic uh, uh, science. Um, so these are the people, although I took, I did, you know, I'm the one who has the microphone, but these are the one who did all the work and they really should get the credit, uh, not just me. Okay? So thank you very much. Questions? how you manipulated the unit, the unit cell? Ah, so if you think about the meaning of a unit cell, that is a cell size at initiations. So now if you do some Gedanken experiments, if you delay initiation timing by uh, crippling some of the initiator proteins, and then a cell will grow without initiating. So that way you can actually increase the uh, unit cell size. And that's exactly the kind of experiments we did. And we used uh, at least three different orthogonal methods to delay initiations, and we observed um, the, the increase of our unit cells. We can also go the other way around as well. You can over-initiate, and, uh, and then the unit cell size becomes actually smaller. So we can actually send unit cell size the way we want. Yeah. So how, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. So does this also work for mammalian cells? I expect it would. Uh, I doubt, and the reason is that the, um, the, 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 I didn't have time to talk about the mechanistic, i give you mechanistic explanations. This works for so-called balanced growth, meaning that uh, in, in physiology, balanced growth means that the, uh, every component in your cell doubles at the same rate as the growth rate. So in mammalian cells, presumably there are a lot of degradations and active control and so on. I think this, that's where the balanced growth condition breaks. So my my first reaction would be it probably wouldn't work for mammalian cells. So, so I had a similar question about the generality of it. So can you push it to yeast? Did it work in bacilli or other bacteria, streptomyces, soil bacteria, fungi? Um, 
uh, an archi. Yeah, yeah. That's excellent questions. Um, so, Edo principle appears to be very valid for most bacteria and their archaea and some mammalian cells and some yeast cells. Okay? This particular general growth law we presented is based on the balanced growth. So if your organism satisfies the condition of a balanced growth, when you double, everything else doubles uh, inside the cells. So is that true of yeast or not? I think it depends on the yeast because, for example, uh, the fission yeast is not adder, whereas mother cell of a budding yeast is adder. So I presume depending on the which organism, the answer will differ. That's a pretty good swath of the phylogenetic tree, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.